Amen. Good morning. Right. Thank God for another day. Do you know that uh, Sunday is our happy day? <laughs> yeah. Sunday is my most relaxing day. Hmm. Sunday is my most happy day because we are here um, giving our praise and worship to God, doing our obedience to Him, following Him. So this is the most beautiful day of the week, Sunday. Do you agree? Do you agree? Amen to that. Amen to that. If you want to be relaxed, you know, every Sunday you go to church and you will be relaxed. Okay. <clears throat> the start of a beautiful, you see? The beginning of our lesson, the start of a beautiful. The start of a beautiful and meaningful life starts with a choice. Then changing our old ways with the new ones. And finally, taking a chance on our choice. For the past weeks, we've been talking about choices. Okay, change. Change is a start of uh, choice. Okay. Now, according to Zig Ziglar, somewhat the same, the three C's of life, choices, chances, and changes. You must make a choice to take a chance or your life will never change. That is true. That is true. So that's why <clears throat> the start of a beautiful and meaningful life starts with a choice. And then after the choice, you change your old ways with the new ones. And taking a chance on that choice of yours. Now we talk about choice and uh, we talk about change. And last Sunday, almost at the last part of the lesson, I said that uh, trying new things is scary. But what is even scarier is regret. I remember one of my friends, when I mentioned this, he told me, you know, Mike, you are wrong. It is not regret that is scarier. And I asked him, what is that? It is the person beside you. It is the person beside you. I was like, you are the person beside me. You know, so trying new things is the scary. Oh, it's scary. But what is even scarier is regret. You know, there's always risk in life. There's always risk in life. There is risk in choosing. Remember that. You might choose the wrong path. You know, there is a risk also in change you might for example you might lose a friend okay when you try to change your life because your new life now you are embracing a new values that's different from your friend's values so therefore you are losing that friend of yours because you are not you do not have the same values together so there is a risk and again you might lose somebody in that course of your life when you change your life okay <clears throat> then regret is the byproduct of the greatest risk in life and that is the risk of not doing nothing do you agree with that the risk of doing nothing you know taking a risk is not being afraid to fail now ladies do you remember when you finally decided to court your husband? I'm ah, sorry. Gentlemen. <laughs> you remember, gentlemen, when you finally decided to court your wife? <clears throat> you know, trying to show for the first time your affection to them. You know, we are taking a risk, actually. You know, we are taking our chances, right? Because we don't know. You know, we don't know how would they react. If they will say yes, or they will give you the thumbs down. So we are taking a chance. 
right? <clears throat> now, I remember at the time I decided to show my feelings to my wife, decided to court her, you know, it's still vivid in my memory until today. I muster all my strength, okay? And I remember telling these words to myself, it is better to love and loss okay, than never to have love at all. I tell that to myself. I told that to myself. I am ready. I will take my chances rather than just sitting down, you know, do nothing and wonder later on what could have been. Right? So today, we will be talking the third C of life. We talk about choice. We did talk about change, and now we will talk about chance. The part of the choice we make, okay, is a taking a chance. So the title of our lesson today, Chance, Navigating to the Unknown of Our Choice. Now, one of the differences between choice and chance is in choice, you have the control to choose. You have the control uh, to choose what to do, what option to pick, and how to act in the different situations that you are in. While chance, on the other hand, you don't have any control over what happens. It is outside of you. While choice, it is within you. Now again, for example, the choice is yours whether to pursue, you know, to court, the woman you love or not. That is your choice. Now, the chance of being accepted or denied, that is not within you. That is outside of you. So that is chance. Okay? So it is in the women's hand. So chance is navigating to the unknown of our choice. Now, taking a chance is our willingness to embrace risk and maintaining a mindset of adaptability in the pursuit of our happiness. Embracing the risk. We said that taking a risk or taking a chance for that matter is never afraid to fail. We should never afraid to fail because if we are afraid to fail, one person quoted, then it is like trying you know, to put yourself six feet under the ground. Because life is about taking chances, about taking a risk. Never afraid of what will meet you along the way. Never afraid of what will come along the way, along the path of your choosing. You know, never afraid on what will come, the challenges, the changes as you pursue your happiness on the road and as you pursue your success in life. Never afraid. And never afraid of what will meet you on the road for the better version of you. Now, when you see those different ads, <clears throat> you have so many different ads, like telephone companies. You know, when you go to the social media, when you go to the network, you Google, there's so much advertising. When you watch YouTube, right? So one after another, one commercial after another. When you go out there, you see billboards. When you go to malls, you see a lot of advert, uh, advertisement. Companies, food chains, telco, telecommunication companies, you know, food supplements, clothing lines, etc. Okay. Now, what are they telling the consumers like you? Why are, they, why are there so many advertisements out there? Okay. What are they telling us? They are telling us that they have the most value for your money. They are telling us that they are the best for your choice over the other option. Right? That's why there are so many advertisements out there. Okay. Trying to outdo one another. Trying to prove that they are better than the other. Now, with all those sales pitches, we will have to choose which one is the best. We will have to choose which one supports our values. 
we will have to choose which one will give us the most edge. Right? So we will have to choose. And hopefully, it will meet our expectations, okay? which is in the future, either sooner or later, as they advertise. Now, as we made that choice, we are taking our chances that we are not being deceived by these people. Correct? Now, in Matthew chapter 11, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> verse 28, Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's why I tell you a while ago, that Sunday is our rest because we are coming to Jesus Christ. How can you be? How can you go wrong with Jesus Christ? How can be somebody to be a Christian for that matter? Say that Sunday, you know, it's a hard thing to do. Say that Sunday is an onerous thing to do. Well, Jesus said, "You come to me, and I will give you rest." And Sunday is our rest day. Not that we will be in our home resting, but we will be in this place being obedient to God, praising Him, glorifying Him, because this is a rest for us. Also in Revelation chapter 22, <clears throat> verse 17, the Spirit and the bride said, Come, let anyone who hears say, Come. Let anyone who is thirsty, Come. Let anyone who desires free drink from the water of life. In Mark 6.31, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me. Buy yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, these verses and other verses out there tells us or an invitation from Jesus Christ to come to him. Okay? Come to him. Come to the fold of God. Because there is one, one thing out there, another thing out there that also wants you. It's not only God that wants you. There is also somebody there that wants you. Be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, rolls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. <laughs> See, there is also somebody out there that wants you, and that is the devil. He wants you. He, is, he goes around. He is watching you. He is watching you very carefully, very intently, and waiting for you. He knows your vulnerability. He knows where you, your weakness so that he can snatch you away from God. He knows that. He is very cunning. That's why I told you one time, don't ever underestimate the power of the devil because the Lord said he is a strong man. And to defeat the strong man, you need a stronger man. And that is Jesus Christ. You cannot do it alone. I'm telling you, don't fool yourself that you can do it alone. You cannot do it alone. You need a stronger, you need somebody stronger than the strong man. To defeat the scheme of the devil, and that is Jesus Christ, my dear brothers and sisters and friends. So he is out there. Now to make your life miserable. He is out there watching you, watching every move that you make. Because he wants your life miserable, and he wants you to forever lost with him into the eternal fire. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for whom? For the devil and his angels. In other translations, the devils and his demons. See? Now, from time immemorial, my dear brethren, Satan has been competing with God, trying to snatch away from God those who belong to him. And trying to snatch away from God as many as possible as he could possibly be or do. And he, he, is a, he always gives lies, pretending to be true. 
Okay. And those lies blinded us, blinded us to see the truth according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. There is no truth in him. There is no truth in the devil. He hides what is true, teaching us what is contrary to what pleases God. And he keeps us in darkness so we won't see the light of the gospel. And he feeds our thoughts with so much deceptions, with so many lies. And he feeds your thoughts with not only lies, but with fears. He feeds your thoughts not only with fears, but with worries. Worries, anxiety. Worries of what? Number one, worries of materialism. That's what the devil is trying to do to us. He is feeding your mind, oh, you need this, you need that, so you need to work, you need to do this, you know. Do not go to church. Do not attend any services. Do not worship God. You're so busy because you needed so many things in life to live. And that is what the devil is trying to feed us so that we won't see the glory of God and the need for Jesus Christ. Now, as we can see, we are presented with two options. Two options. And the choice is ours. Now, in the left corner, we have Satan. You have the devil, which is presenting himself, disguising himself, covering up, cover up, disguising himself as what? As the truth. Do you know the very first words that came out of Satan's mouth? Let's see. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now listen to this. He said to the woman, did God really say? <laughs> did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You see, the very first words of Satan, Brother Michael, did God really say? <laughs> did God really say you know there was a suspicion for truth suspicion for truth did God really say that you must not eat suspicion for the truth it was meant to raise a doubt not only about God what God said but also to doubt God. Now let's go to verse 4. Let's go to verse 4. The second words after verse 3 that he said, You will not surely die. And I would like to add, ha 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 ha. The devil said, you will not surely die, Brother Marcus. See, this word of Satan is what? It's an affirmation of the falsehood of God. The first one, did he truly say? Raising the suspicion, suspicion for the truth. And when he said, you will not surely die, it is an affirmation of the falsehood of God. He is not God. You will not surely die. He is lying to you. Listen to me. He is now telling you that God is a liar. You see, first he raised the suspicion of the truthfulness of God. And now he affirms that God is false. A fake God. A God that cannot be trusted. That is Satan at the left corner. On the right corner, there is God. The right corner is God. We have God. The real God. The true God. 
Now, Jesus tells us, come to me. Come to me. Now, we knew what happened to Adam and Eve when they chose evil. People knew what happened to them. Jesus said, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Let me teach you in other translations. Let me teach you. Let me teach you my ways. Why? What is Jesus' way? He said, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Hallelujah. You will find rest. That's why Sunday, thank you, Lord, it's my rest day. It's our rest day. We enjoy. We are enjoying our fellowship with one another. Are you not enjoying your fellowship with your fellow brothers and sisters? Yes, we are. We are. Jesus is telling us that his teachings, his way of life is not grievous. He encourages us to learn his ways. You know, he encourages us to study his words. Let Jesus teach you. Let Jesus, through the pages of the Bible, guide you in all wisdom, his ways, his way of living. And he said that he is a humble teacher. He is a humble teacher and gentle at heart. Now, in the end, Jesus said, you will find rest in your souls. Jesus is telling you and I to choose him. Choose me. Come to me. Take your chances with me. Now, a big difference between <clears throat> Jesus and Satan is that Jesus will not hide anything from you. He will tell us all there is that we need to know, whether we like it or not. Whether it, if it hurts you or not, he will tell you everything. He will not lie. Not like Satan. He will lie to you. There is no truth in him. He will hide all the truth. He will masquerade as the truth. Now, what do I mean by this? We are talking about embracing, embracing the risk, taking chances. You see, <clears throat> right off the bat, Jesus tells us that if we choose him, if we choose him, you know, there are some unpleasant things along the journey with him. You know that. We know that it's not all beds of roses. Right off the bat, Jesus tells us, you will be hated. You will be hated. And if you go to John 16, there will be problems. There will be tribulations. You will be hated by everyone because of who? Because of me. Jesus right there, he tells us, he's not lying, that you will be hated because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. He does not need to sugarcoat his words to make it more appealing. No, he will not do that. He will tell you the way it is, and he will not lie. Then he said, then they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed. Wow. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Now Jesus said, come to me, come to me. And you will be hated. Come to me and you will be delivered. Come to me and you will be killed. Huh? <laughs> talking about get, uh, talking about you know, taking our chances with Jesus Christ. Lord, what did you say? You want me to take my chances with you and I'll be dead? Come on. Yes, Jesus said yes. Yes. Is he not lying, Brother Mike? No, he's not. That's the truth. That's the truth. You know, talking about in the right company. <laughs> you see? But Jesus said, you know, come to me. Take your chances with me. You will be hated. But guess what? At the end of the day, you will have eternal life in heaven. There you go. There you go. Lord, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. You see? Because this life, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, it's temporary. This is temporary. You see me now? I see you now? 
Lord willing, tomorrow we will see each other again. Lord willing, next Sunday we will see each other again. If it's the Lord's will. Temporary. We might not see each other next Sunday. Do you believe? Yes. That is the reality. That is the reality. We might not see each other next Sunday. That is the reality of life. But Jesus Christ said, you come to me, take your chances with me, and you will be with me in heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen to that. Amen to that. Lord, I'm in. I'm in. You see? Jesus is all about the truth. That's who he is. The truth. But of course, at the end of it all, you know, there is heaven waiting for us if we endure till the end. You know, the 12 apostles, they took the risk. Paul took the risk. The 3,000 souls that were baptized during Pentecost, they took the risk. The believers after them, they took the risk. And you and I, when we accepted Jesus Christ, when we said yes at that moment, and we went, when we were immersed to that water, we said, yes, Lord, I will give my life to you till the end. We took the chance with Christ. We are taking the risk with Christ because we know that the risk far outweighs the benefit. For we know to whom we are having our faith. We all embrace the risk, as I've said, because the, the benefits far outweigh the risk, and earth is temporary. And heaven is eternal happiness. Embrace the risk. Take your chance with Jesus Christ. And second, the mindset of adaptability. When you take your chance, when you are taking your chances, you are embracing the risk and you are maintaining a mindset, a mindset of adaptability. You know, as we journey on the path of our choosing, we don't know what we will meet on that road. And for sure, we will be presented with, you know, with another choice to make. It's choice upon choice upon choice, one after another. And as we travel through our path, as we are journeying, there will also be the possibility of the course being redirected. You know, this is the way I'm going, but there will come a time that my course will be redirected by God or by the situations and that we must have an adaptive, adaptive mindset. Okay. Now, an adaptive mindset, a mindset of adaptability or an adaptive mindset is one that responds positively to changes and challenges, seeing them as opportunities and making changes for the better you. We say that the only constant, oh, that, the, that the change is the only constant in life. Okay, change is the only constant in life. So therefore, adaptation is a constantly evolving process because change is constantly evolving or constantly changing change is constant so we therefore need to adapt to these changes it's an evolving process we continue to adapt to what situations we are in our minds continue to find solutions to make life better every day and as we develop a mindset of adaptability, you know, our hands become more productive. Our way of thinking, our minds become more creative. Our mentality becomes more resilient. And our choices, our decisions, more intelligent. And that's the benefit of having an adaptive mindset. And having developed this kind of mindset, we are better able to handle adversity. 
we are better able to maneuver ourselves along life's obstacles. When our life is being redirected, we are able, we are better able to maneuver ourselves with the obstacles. We are better able to pick ourselves up after the storm and live a life all over again. When you develop an adaptive mindset. Now the Bible talks about this kind of mindset. In Proverbs 24 verse 16, it says the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. This is an adaptive mindset. Even though how many times you trip, you fail, because you are resilient, you have an adaptive mindset, you will get up. But those who are not resilient, those who have not this kind of adaptive mindset, the first time they fall, they will never get up. They are easily defeated. You see, but one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. When the Israelites <clears throat> left Egypt, okay, after the plague, particularly the tenth plague, the very first time the Israelites complained against God was just right after when they left Egypt. When the king realized that all the Israelites were gone and uh, he had no more servants, no more slaves, he pursued them with these 600 chariots, if I'm not mistaken. Now the, the Israelites, seeing all the chariots coming after them, they complained. They complained. They said to Moses, what have you done to us? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There were plenty of graves for us in Egypt. You see that mindset? There are plenty of graves in Egypt for us to die. We told you in Egypt, let us alone. We will stay and serve the Egyptians. Now we will die in the desert. And then after God saved them and, you know, Deliver them by parting the Red Sea. In the desert, again and again, they complain. They complain about the water. They complain about uh, they are hungry and so on. There's, they continuously complain about against God and grumble against God. But God promised them a better life. God promised them a better life and a land that will be theirs. The promised land, Canaan. And they took the chance. They took the choice. They took the choice of going with God, of going with Moses. And they took the path. You see, they have a choice. They have a choice to stay in Egypt and be forever a slave of the Egyptians. But they choose to leave Egypt and follow Moses to the promised land because they have seen in their in their mind, they projected in their mind the promised land. And they took the chance with God. But along the way, you see, years in the wilderness, they never learned. They never learned to have an, adapt an adaptive mindset. Every time, you know, they feel uncomfortable, they grumble immediately against God. They will complain against God. You see, the evil, the devil knew their weaknesses. So the devil exploited, exploited it so that the Israelites would be blinded and not see what? And not see the glory of God. You know, despite God's mercy, despite of God's goodness to them, all they saw was just themselves. Me, myself, and I. All they saw. It's just for their glorification and for their satisfaction. Now, in the process, many died and never saw Canaan. Why? Well, because they never learned to have a mindset of adaptability. They never learned to have an adaptive mindset as they take a chance on the unknown path of their choice. Now, along the journey with God, God was steering their course. The people never learn. The Israelites never learn to adapt the ways of God. They never learn resiliency. They never learn positively 
they never learned, they never responded positively to changes and challenges that faced them along the way as they travel from Egypt going to the promised land. They never learned to adapt. They never saw an opportunity to have a deeper relationship with God. No, they never saw an opportunity to have an intimate conversation with God. Whenever they have a problem, they grumble against God. They never saw that as an opportunity to commune, to communicate with God in a more intimate fashion. No. What they saw was punishment. And they responded with, Lord, you bring me out here to die. Lord, we don't have this. Give me this, give me that. You know, instead of talking to God in a more respectable way, instead of looking that as an opportunity again to have a wonderful and intimate relationship with God. Now, on the other hand, Apostle Paul adapted. From being a church persecutor, he became a church planter. From being a believer's nightmare, you know, all the believers, I, I, um, I could see that all the believers were afraid of Apostle Paul. So from a believer's nightmare, he became a believer's defender. When Jesus showed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus in, in Acts chapter 9, you know, Paul changed his, <clears throat> he changed his life by choosing to follow Jesus, by taking a chance with Jesus Christ. See, Jesus only revealed his plan to Paul, okay, for Paul, to Ananias. Okay. When Jesus said to Ananias, go because this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the people of Israel, for I will show him how much he suffered or much suffer for the sake of my name. Paul never knew these things. Jesus Christ only revealed this to Ananias. But, you know, Ananias could have broken this news to Paul. But Paul, you know, he could have an idea of the suffering that he would face when uh, he would serve Christ. But up to what extent of suffering, up to what pain, level of pain, he didn't know. Because he never experienced firsthand how to suffer for Jesus Christ. We know that he was the one giving sufferings to the people. But he never experienced it to himself. I remember when I was a kid back home, when the doctors and the nurses would give us a, a injection, a flu shot. They normally do it in our butt cheek back, back then. You know? And they will say for those kids, the first timer, because they will cry. They are afraid of the needles. The doctors and the nurses would say, oh, relax. Think of it. It's like a a little mosquito bite or just an ant bite. So the kids would relax. Okay, I got this. It's like a, mos a small mosquito bite or a small ant bite. And then it would go like this and then the doctor or the nurses will you know, inject the needle. And after that, ow! ow oh, I thought you said a small mo mosquito bite or a small ant bite. Yes, but it's 500 of them. <laughs> It's 500 small mosquitoes and 500 small ants. <laughs> See, Apostle Paul never experienced firsthand the suffering, the pain. So now he is the receiving end. See, he learned to adapt. He learned to adapt. Though he knew what he will go through, but never did he imagine what kind, what level of pain. You see? But he endured it. Now, but Paul, both Paul and Barnabas replied, it was necessary to speak the word of God to you first since you reject it and do, do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We are turning to the Jews, or to the Gentiles. Paul learned to adapt. When Paul and Barnabas they were preaching, were giving the, the, the news, the gospel, to the Jews in their first missionary journey. Most of the Jews turned their backs. Now Paul learned to adapt. He saw an opportunity 
Now, I will bring this good news to the Gentiles. You see, Paul said, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. When Paul was in prison, he saw an opportunity to advance the gospel. Remember the jailer and his family in his second missionary journey. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the rest of the prisoners were listening. And in the following verses, it says the jailer and all his family were baptized. While Paul was also in prison in Rome, in Philippians, Caesar's household and guards were, uh, were, were baptized. Some of the guards, the Praetorian guards, they believed. In Philippians 4.22, all the saints greet you, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. You see, Paul saw an opportunity even while he was in prison. And while he was in prison, he wrote his, the, his four epistles, or what is called the four prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul never saw prison as a threat. He saw it as an opportunity to advance the gospel. That is having an adaptive mindset. See? Now, brothers, sisters, and friends, I want you to continue your life with Jesus Christ. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, and to our friends listening, may I suggest, and as I presented, take your chance with Jesus. Why? You, you are already walking in the ways of the world. We already walk the ways of the world. You are already in the way of sin. Now, at the end of life's path, we know that it is not the winning path. Now, it's time to change our ways by choosing Jesus Christ and taking our chances with Him. It's high time to walk with Jesus, and as we walk with Him, you embrace the risk. And it's all worth it. And First Peter chapter 1, verse 7 tells us, even gold is tested for genuineness by fire. Now, as you journey with God, have an adaptive mindset. Always see an opportunity. Always see an opportunity to advance the gospel. Always see an opportunity for the glory of God. Never lose sight of heaven. Matthew 24, 13 tells us, he that persevere to the end will be saved. And I want all of us to remember these words of invitation by Jesus Christ again. He said, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. If you are not yet with Jesus Christ, dream this word. Dream these words. Come to me. If you are not yet in Jesus Christ, if you have not yet repented of your sins and you have not yet baptized, immerse yourself into Christ, and you are not yet walking with Christ, remember these words. Come to me. And finally, let me leave you with these words in John chapter 6, verse 68. Why would you come to Jesus? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. How can you lose with the one who has the eternal life? Again, the gospel is yours. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, may we encourage you to come to Jesus this very moment and accept him. Repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And for that, shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation. Good morning.